This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. Tom Sullivan was a tank platoon commander in Korea in the early 1980s, responsible for six tanks and their crew. We hear why he joined the US Army, his training and his first impressions of Korea in the winter of 1982. He's assigned to 2nd Platoon C Company 172 Armour under the toughest company commander in the brigade, who had very high standards, no humour and was a rigid disciplinarian with an uncompromising approach. Tom shares details of his fellow soldiers including Vietnam veterans as well as the living conditions. He explains the challenges of operating armour where the winter weather is brutal and the majority of the terrain is hills, mountains, rice paddies and dirt roads. We discuss the threat the North Koreans posed and the scarce hope that reinforcements would arrive in sufficient time should the North Koreans decide to attack. I'm delighted to welcome Tom Sullivan to our Cold War conversation. You know, it kind of goes back to my childhood, the discovery in in an old cigar box of my grandfather's things. And he had served, interestingly, in 2nd Infantry Division in the First World War. And he he was a Marine and uh, fought at Bella Wood and Soissons and Blancmont and, you know, all the major um, U.S. engagements of the First World War. And I, I was just fascinated with that history. Um, which kind of led me to become, uh, you know, a history aficionado and a history major in college. Uh, my dad had served in the Navy uh, during World War II on a destroyer. Um, he, he, he got as far as Guantanamo Bay, Cuba uh, when the war ended, uh, but he had that service. And all my uncles um, had served in, in the Second World War. And a cousin of my mother's had served in the 101st Airborne in World War II and regaled me with hours and hours and hours of stories. And so I just became interested in, in the military in general and um, ended up going to uh, a military school uh, before I was commissioned into the Army. But it, it was something that I, I had pursued since I was a young kid. And why did you choose armor and not the Navy, for example? Well, I, you know, <laughs> the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Air Force, none of those services interested me. Um, I, I, again, because I was interested in history, um, one of my goals was to get to uh, Europe, get to Germany. Um, I wanted to see for myself what Europe was all about, what Germany was all about, to be able to visit some of the sites that I was interested in in, in Germany. And um, the Army in particular had a much wider menu of options and opportunities uh, than the other services. Um, I had considered the Marine Corps because of my grandfather. uh, But again, they were um, essentially on the East Coast, the West Coast of the United States, and Okinawa, Japan. And so it wasn't going to get me to where I I wanted to go. And they also didn't have um, the menu of options available. and Ironically, I got um, assigned to military intelligence as my branch, and uh, the Commandant of Cadets um, ran into me shortly after I had been assigned to military intelligence, and he, he told me he was disappointed in me um, because uh, he, he thought I was going to go into the combat arms. And um, I, my response to him was, well, I'm disappointed as well. I really wanted to be an armor officer. And within 30 minutes, he had me back in his office and, um, and told me that I had been reassigned to the armor branch. Um, he had made a phone call to a friend of his, um, Colonel Fred Franks, who was on his way to command the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment in Germany. And uh, Colonel Franks, later General Franks, um, apparently made a phone call to somebody <laughs> and got me changed. And so that's how I ended up becoming an armor officer when I graduated. Can you tell me about the training 
to become an armoured officer in that period. So this is early 80s we're talking now. Uh, this is 1982. So I graduated in May and I reported to active duty the day after graduation uh, because I had a regular army commission. And um, so got in my car the day after graduation and drove to Fort Knox, Kentucky uh, to attend the armor officer basic course. Uh, and the basic course uh, essentially teaches you exactly that, just the basics. It teaches you everything from navigation to maintenance to gunnery to all the administrative things that, that a young officer needs to be uh, schooled in uh, before you get to your first assignment. And, and, and quite honestly, a lot of it you didn't remember two months later. Um, you, you had to actually uh, have the practical application of it, um, actually hands-on, do it, get in the motor pool, put your put your coveralls on and get dirty, or even the admin stuff, you, you had to actually sit down and figure out the paperwork. And, and um, so I didn't find it to be as, um, as effective as I, as I had hoped. And I think it was about three or four months long at the time. I'm not sure. Um, I don't remember the timeline, but you know, it, it, it set you up for success. It gave you the basics. And I think the, 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 probably the most beneficial part of it was gunnery. We had, um, a British gunnery instructor. Uh, he was a, a warrant officer and his name was Gossage and he was uh, absolutely incredible. He, he, a master gunner, just an absolute expert on everything that you could imagine about a tank. And at the time we were training on M60A1 rise passive tanks. And I, I think that was probably the most beneficial part of the basic course was I, um, it, it was probably something I paid more attention to, quite honestly, than any of the other aspects, the admin <laughs> aspects and all those other things. And I just was fascinated with gunnery and I really embraced it. And and um, between him and another master gunner who was um, one of our instructors, I think I, I got to my first unit knowing way more than the average uh, average person because of those two guys. I wasn't aware that the uh, the, the British supplied instructors to the to the u.s army imagine some armies are sort of like well we know how to teach this why do we need help from the brits well you know we have um at, at the armor center in school and in fact at all of the uh, u.s army um schools so to speak the infantry school the armor school the artillery school they have uh both liaisons and exchanges and so when you go to any of those places, you'll find um, a, a contingent of um, British, French, Canadian, Australian um, officers and NCOs who augment the staff. Uh, and they give you a, you know, they give you a, a, a really interesting perspective because they look at things um, from a different angle than we often do. And so it's, I think it's a huge benefit uh, in the training process. As part of that training, did you have to know how to work in each different position within the M60? Yeah, you did. You, you, had to, um, you had to qualify on all four crew positions. You had to qualify with all the weapon systems. Um, you, you, know, you had to know how to disassemble assembly, clearing and function checks for the M240 machine gun, or uh, on the M60, it was the M85 machine gun. Um, the 50 caliber M2 HP, um, the main gun, um, you had to knew, know how to drop the breech and clean it and change out firing pins and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and you went through a thing called the tank crew gunnery skills test, which tested you on, um, all aspects of that, um, everything about gunnery, um, and, and each individual weapon that, that was uh, part of a tank and you had to qualify in the driver's position, the loader's position, the gunner's position, and the tank commander's position. And I remember, you know, I remember being on a live fire range and I was actually the driver and I was in a buttoned up M60 and one of the crew members had, um, you know, these stupid lieutenants, you know, one of them had laid the coax machine gun against the turret um, wall um, before it was being installed. And when the tank commander traversed the turret, uh, the M240 fell down against the hull of the tank and got crushed against the wiring harness and set the tank on fire. 
And so I was in the, I was in the driver's seat and the crew was, you know, three other lieutenants and I just keyed my mic and I said, Hey, the tank's on fire. And the next thing I saw was them running away from the tank. <laughs> and, uh, so that was part of it, you know, and the, luckily the NCOs who were teaching us put it out and, uh, uh, no injuries or anything, but the tank was sure wrecked after that. But yeah, that was, so that was my experience of training as a driver or part of it anyway. Cause I, cause I guess part, part of the training is how to bail out of a tank if you get hit. Yeah, absolutely. Bailout drills and, um, you know, crew drills were a, a, a key aspect of that, you know, uh, the fire command process, and then each individual member of the crew's responsibilities related to the fire command. Um, and then, you know, just on regular operations. And part of the training was uh, a 10 day field exercise where you went out and uh, uh, lived on the tanks, uh, maneuvered the tanks, uh, and you, you essentially learned how to be an active member of a crew in a field environment. And I got to tell you, that was good training because. Um, you know, if you're if you're um, new to the army, learning how to live outdoors and learning how to live on a tank um, is a is a sort of a difficult process. It's a very steep learning curve because you're not used to it, and how to um, how to cope with living in the pouring rain, you know, wind, freezing cold. Um, the living conditions are just um, something that you know you you really have to get experience that before you become comfortable in that environment yeah and i guess those those skills came in particularly useful in in korea as i hear the climate there is somewhat extreme yeah absolutely i i grew up in upstate new york and and um you know so i was very used to um very cold conditions very um deep snow you know the winds off the um off the snow and and that kind of thing and I've never been as cold in my life as I was in Korea. It was painfully cold, and the wind coming out of the Chorwon Valley uh, would just cut your heart out. And to try and live in that uh, was was one of the biggest challenges, I think. It was the first winter. I spent two winters there, really. And the first winter was just absolutely excruciating. That is a consistent theme I hear from uh, veterans who've uh served in korea there was definitely uh warmer postings than uh than korea um were you trained at all in escape and evasion no um there, there was nothing uh nothing like escape and evasion and uh you know when you look at the environment in korea in particular um we we didn't expect to <laughs> last very long um we were kind of like out, out on our own there and it would have taken weeks uh, weeks and weeks and weeks probably to get any reinforcements in, much, much like during the Korean War um, at the beginning. And escape and evasion probably would have been something that we would cons be concerned about, I would imagine. Um, but no, there was no no formal training in that at all. So did you, did you have a choice of places where you could serve or were you just told you're on your way to Korea? No, we did have a choice. Um, generally, the way the army works is, uh, you know, you're given a you're given a sheet that says, you know, what are your top choices? You know, let's say one to five or whatever it was. Um, and my top choice was Korea, and I got it. Um, and my second choice was West Germany, um, and I don't remember the mechanics of it, but. I did go to Korea for a year, and then when that tour was over, I went from Korea uh, straight to, to Germany. So from the 2nd Infantry Division in Korea to the 1st Infantry Division in Germany. When you arrive in Korea, what, what's your first impressions? I mean, how, how do you get to Korea? Is it flight, I'm presuming? But what, what are your first impressions as well? Yeah, the, um, the, the long trek to Korea, and you, and you had to fly at the time, you had to Playing your class a uniform and so you're in this class a uniform and you got a couple of duffel bags full of gear and the flight went from um from louisville kentucky which is near fort knox where the armor officer basic course was uh to san francisco i think we went to anchorage from there and then to tokyo 
and then Tokyo to Yongsan Air Base in uh, just south of Seoul, Korea. And I remember um, very clearly, you know, we, we were all mostly new, new people, young soldiers and young officers going there. And I remember very clearly, um, if you remember the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan um, a few years earlier, and I remember the newsreel footage of, uh, you know, quad 50s or, or, or any aircraft trucks lined up down the runway and the wind swept snow going across and it looked pretty miserable. Um, and that's exactly what it looked like when we touched down at, at Osan Air Base. Uh, there were uh, any aircraft emplacements all along the runway. The wind was blowing really strong, snow across the runway. And I remember the pilot said it was uh, nine degrees below zero with a wind chill of 21 below uh, Fahrenheit. So it, it was uh, miserably cold. And then from there, uh, we were bussed up to Camp Casey, uh, which is where 2nd Infantry Division headquarters was. And there was, um, there was a subset of the, of the camp that was called the Turtle Farm. And um, that was where you went and they would assign you to a unit um, from there. And so you were, you were there for, let's say, a couple of days. And then somebody from the unit you were assigned to would come and get you. And it was, a, um, it was an administrative camp. And so I got, to the, I got to the turtle farm and I immediately called a good friend of mine. Uh, Lieutenant George Seiferth, who was a platoon leader in first of the 72nd armor at Camp Casey. And I called him, I said, George, I'm here in Korea. Uh, George and I had gone to school together and George said, well, I'll be right down. And he took the duty Jeep, uh, from the duty officer and he drove down to the, uh, to the turtle farm put me in the Jeep, threw my duffel bags in the back and drove to the tank battalion headquarters. And of course, this was not, uh, this was not authorized. I, I had an in-process or anything. And the next day, the battalion commander uh, called the head of the um, AG detachment there. And he said, uh, okay, this guy is now in my unit. I own him. And that's how I ended up in the unit. <laughs> So not really following the uh, due process, but uh, bypassing it somewhat. Exactly, exactly. And I'm, and I'm so glad uh, that happened because it, it turned out to be uh, one of the best assignments of my career. So you arrive in the platoon. You know, what, what, what are the first things that, that happen? Presumably you're, you're introduced to your uh, company commander and his views on discipline and cleanliness and stuff like that i was introduced to uh, my company commander who was a notoriously um difficult uh guy he was very very uh disciplined serious um attention to detail uh i mean he had a reputation in the whole battalion um if not in the brigade of being probably the toughest commander to work for um, of anybody. And I don't remember my exact introduction to him, but, um, but let's just say that he was the, the, the absolute perfect first boss to ever work for because he set standards really high and he didn't put up with any nonsense. And so my particular case was that he, he had a, he had three platoon leaders, um, and an executive officer, the platoon that I was going to take over, 2nd Platoon, Charlie Company, 1st of the 72nd Armor, had a platoon leader in place. And that platoon leader was um, shortly going to leave Korea. His, his tour of duty had ended, but they wanted him to take the platoon through what was called the Army Training and Evaluation Program, uh, the RTEPS, which was a big field exercise where every platoon leader and platoon was evaluated by officers from the battalion and brigade you know were they able to do all the things that were mission essential for a platoon to do um, at the individual and collective level and so they wanted him to stay in charge of the platoon uh, and my role in this because we were overlapping 
would be to just be one of his tank commanders. And again, th- this was, you know, uh, the perfect storm for me because I could just sit back and command a tank and observe uh, the non-commissioned officers and the soldiers of the platoon before I formally took it over when he, um, when he departed a couple of weeks later. And so, so that's what we did. And, you know, as a brand new guy in Korea, I got to tell you, it was absolutely miserable. It was like excruciatingly cold. Um, you know, most of the tanks, the heaters don't work on them because they're fairly old tanks. And, you know, you're in this freezing chunk of steel. And when you're inside of a tank um, in that kind of environment, it's even colder than it is outside of the tank. And so I had a fairly miserable time, but I did benefit from being able to, uh, to look at the platoon and evaluate it and decide how I was going to lead the platoon once he departed. Each, each platoon, by the way, had six tanks. Uh, which is unusual because the TONE table of organization um, and allowances only called for five um, at the time. It was a um, eight series tank battalion. And so what they do is they took the executive officer's tanks and they parceled them out to each platoon. And so each platoon had six tanks and the XO generally rode in a Jeep uh, and not on his tank. And the CO normally read, rode in the Jeep and not in his tank, except when they had to qualify. So I got to, I got to sit back and evaluate the platoon and I made one decision and that was, I wasn't going to accept responsibility for the platoon with that particular platoon sergeant, because I, I saw him as incompetent, abusive, um, and just not, not a good leader at all. And so I told, I told the commander, uh, that I wouldn't take the platoon until he relieved that platoon sergeant which he did. Uh, and then one of the tank matters became my platoon sergeant. So that was my first exposure and my first experience. That must have been really useful being able to sort of view the characteristics and personalities of, of the platoon without, you know, being directly responsible for them straight, straight off the bat, I guess. Yeah, I highly recommend that approach. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I wish they would institutionalize that. Um, but uh, it, it was uh, it was very beneficial to me. And I got to see the different personalities. And, you know, when you have a mix of personalities and a uh, mix of backgrounds and experiences, a uh, mix of ranks, it's absolutely fascinating. It's, it's um, you know, you get to see who you can rely on, um, who you're going to have to pressure a little bit, um, you know, who, who's going to take the initiative, who's going to need to be told what to do. Uh, and you get to figure all that out before you're actually uh, formally in charge of them. So it was, uh, it was really good. I presume around about this period, there would have still been some Vietnam War veterans serving with you as well. Yeah, there were. There were, uh, there were a number of Vietnam veterans, um, the, mostly the senior um, officers and senior non-commissioned officers. So, for example, the, um, the battalion commander, the battalion executive officer, they were Vietnam veterans, the command sergeant major, of course. Um, and then several of the um, senior NCOs, even within the company, the first sergeant and a couple of the platoon sergeants were Vietnam veterans. And some of them were... You know, some of them clearly had had um, benefited from their experiences and were superb leaders. Um, and then there were others who, you know, the experience really didn't have much of an impact. Um, they would have been they would have been bad in any circumstance. And so you had to you had to cope with you know, as a young lieutenant, you, you you're always sort of at a disadvantage with some of your NCOs because they see you as the inexperienced young kid. And they're the older experienced one. Um, But in some cases, you were a better soldier than they were, even though they had that all, all, all that experience behind them, if that makes sense. How much involvement did the Korean army have with your unit? Were there any Korean troops embedded within your unit? Yes, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not sure if they still do it there, but in Korea, since the Korean War, uh, there was a program called Korean Augmentation Troops to the United States Army. We call them katusas, and they were 
conscripts uh, who exhibited some level of uh, English capability. Some of them were, were pretty fluent and some of them were not so fluent, but they were embedded in the units. They were actually part of your unit. They were um, gunners, drivers, loaders. Um, there was a Katusa first sergeant in my company. There was a Katusa sergeant major in my battalion. There were Korean rock army liaison officers at the brigade level and higher. So in my platoon, I had six tanks and each one of them had a Korean um, soldier assigned to that tank crew as a Katusa. And they provided uh, a huge amount of interpretive skills. Um, they, they, you know, they put things in perspective when we went to the field. They could negotiate with locals if anything went wrong. To me, uh, it was a hugely beneficial program, and I used them uh, really to my advantage as often as I could. And some of them, you know, because they were conscripts, some of them wanted no part of this um, scenario, and they were very difficult to um, to deal with, and they were, you know, difficult soldiers to manage. Um, and then others, um, I think they figured, hey, you know, this is a, I, I forget if it was a three or four year um, conscription and they embraced it and they were superb uh, soldiers and NCOs. I even had one of our platoon sergeants, Harry Griffith was the um, one of the other platoon sergeants uh, and he was a master gunner and he actually configured his crew to be all Korean. So it was, you know, a Korean driver, loader and gunner and his tank was the only tank to shoot distinguished at our, at our battalion gunnery with an all Korean crew. And so, you know, they were, they were good. Yeah. And no, I guess that would help to build your command skills, you know, working with like a multinational crew like that as well, because as you said, there's different challenges around that and that would just help to expand your, you know, your abilities. Right, right. Well, you know, on my crew in particular, on uh, Charlie 2 1, I had a driver who was um, a Vietnamese refugee who had been an officer in the Vietnamese Army and was now uh, a private in the United States Army. Um, so, Vietnamese driver, I had um, a Korean loader, a Katusa, um, Private Lim. And then I had my gunner was a guy named um, Killeran, and later Chris Leverton was my gunner, and uh, just a great crew, you know, and a very diverse crew. Yeah, sort of United Nations crew there, which uh, is almost <laughs> quite symbolic. What with the uh, United Nations, you know, involvement in the Korean War, <laughs> there right. as well. Um, what about working with Korean? army units we, we, did you exercise with them so that you could work with them should the balloon go up fantastic question interestingly no um you know they would give uh the second infantry division or eighth army its own sector and then the rock army would have its own sector tom uses the term rock army throughout this interview and what he's indicating there is the republic of korea or the south korean army um, even on the DMZ, you know, there was the, the um, Western Corridor sec sector was the United States. And then all the other sectors across the entire DMZ, across the peninsula were Rock Army. And so we didn't, uh, there was no interoperability. Um, we didn't, um, you know, we didn't shoot gunnery with them. We didn't go on field exercises together. You know, you would go out in the field and you would drive by Rock Army camps or bases, uh, but you didn't interact with them. You didn't go to the field with them. And if we had to, we, we could have easily done that because we had the Katusas with us. We, you know, it was easy to, um, you know, pull up alongside a rock army unit and communicate with them if we had to. We did go against them on exercises. Um, on Team Spirit 83, for example, uh, the blue forces included a certain number of American units um, and rock army units and the orange forces, the uh, the ones we were going against were rock army and U S forces. So there was that, but I don't think, I don't think the units intermingled at all. I think they had, you know, this is a rock army, uh, brigade sector. This is an American brigade sector. 
And Team Spirit was sort of like the Korean equivalent of Reforger, was it? That's exactly right. Exactly right. They would they would um, ship in units from the states, generally from Hawaii, 25th Infantry Division in Hawaii, and um, and other units. And then we would go to the field for you know three or four weeks at a time and and uh, maneuver horse on horse. And it would give them it would give them the perspective of how do you deploy all your soldiers and your equipment to the Korean Peninsula, um, hopefully in a in an expedited manner. And and then you know we spent the time driving around the countryside, um, doing war games, very very much like Reforger, and it gave those stateside units that Korean flavor as well. You know what does the terrain look like? How do you maneuver? Um, how do you cope with the the, the environment um, and that that sort of thing? What was the uh, length of service that a, a U.S. serviceman would have? in in korea normally was it about a year that they would be there it was a it was a one-year unaccompanied tour uh, it was very much encouraged uh, that people extend and so quite often soldiers would extend for a second year soldiers and officers um, and then interestingly um, i think because the soldiers who served there embraced it so much they they you know they liked the service aspects of it they liked the social aspects of it um, because there was a a village outside the gate that provided you all kinds of entertainment um, and they they liked that lifestyle they liked the country and so quite often you would have um, NCOs in your company that were on their third or fourth tour of Korea and they just kept coming back for more because they liked it so much Wow even with the weather even with the weather and well, like i said after the first year once you get uh acclimated and you know how to live in it um it's not quite as bad as that first year what were your sort of like living conditions in korea i mean the the image i always get is of mash naturally although most people think it was it's vietnam war but it was in fact korea um so was it temporary accommodation or were you in sort of some sort of permanent accommodation when I first got there, um, for the first month or two, um, I lived in a Quonset hut and I'm sure a lot of your listeners know what a Quonset hut is. Um, a Quonset hut was developed in the first, uh, second world war, I think, and they were designed to be temporary. <laughs> and here we were, you know, 35 years later, um, and I'm living in a Quonset hut. Um, and they're actually not bad. You know, they it went, once you, spruce up the inside it's okay and then i moved from there to a building that wasn't much different than a quonset hut it just wasn't that half cylindrical shape it was a a, a metal structure um that had been around forever and you know you had a it was it was like a dorm room and you had two lieutenants to a room you had um bunk beds um but you know on two desks and you could you could have a stereo system, that kind of thing. So the living conditions weren't bad. And the troops, the troops in my company lived in Quonset huts. Um, and they weren't, they weren't bad. You know, they were, um, they were like any other barracks room in the States. It was just a strangely shaped building. And those structures um, are still used today. I think they've replaced most of the living, um, living barracks with large, you know, kind of three or four story high barracks buildings. So there are a lot better living conditions now, not as cramped, uh, but still the, the battalion that I served in, the headquarters is still a concert hut to this day. And so uh, those were the living conditions. And then, you know, on the base, you had a post exchange and you had little snack bars here and there. And the Koreans had their own snack bars, which was interesting. And yeah, of course you had barber shops and things like that. So it wasn't a bad, wasn't a bad place to be, um, and, and, you know, a short distance from the DMZ, uh, but the living conditions were actually pretty good. I mean, we, we've talked about the the weather, but can you just talk about the, the terrain that you were going to be operating in? Yeah, the, the, the terrain in Korea is, is uh, very, very difficult and very challenging. Um, and I think it's the reason that the North Korean 
threat is primary, primarily a light infantry and artillery threat. And the troops that have the most maneuverability in Korea are light infantry. Um, light infantry, air mobile infantry. Um, mechanized forces in Korea are in, uh, encounter terrain that is it's essentially mountains, rice paddies, and roads. And, you know, generally people who aren't familiar with it think, well, then you can just drive cross country, drive across rice paddies, and, you know, you have these wide maneuverability corridors and things like that. But, but that's not the case at all. Um, in the summertime, uh, the rice paddies, of course, are, are full of water and they're mud. And if you took a tank across a rice paddy, it would mire down very quickly and then you would have to recover it. Um, and so it's not very conducive to, to mechanized operations or even motorized operations. And then in the winter time, when you leave the road and drive across frozen rice paddies, uh, about every 50 to 100 meters, there's a, a paddy dike. And so you're going to um, you're going to try and overcome that dike uh, with a tracked vehicle and you're going to expose the belly of the tank and then you're going to slam down on the suspension and then drive another 50 meters and do it all over again. So it's not it's not very um, maneuverable, uh, even in the wintertime. And so you're restricted to the roads. Um, augmenting the roads for maneuverability are rivers and streams. And all the rivers and streams are rock bed um, water obstacles. And so they're, they're relatively easily traversed um, in a tank or a, a armored personnel carrier. And you can use those as mobility cores. So you can drive up a riverbed very easily in a tank. Um, and so that's what we would do. If we, if we didn't want to be restricted to the roads, we would use um, rivers and streams. And then sometimes there would be um, rivers or streams that were too deep uh, or, or very deep. And so the M4085, which is the tank um, we had at the time, uh, you, could, you could lock down the turret, inflate the turret ring, uh, turret seal, and you could deep water forward. And so you could go into water that was, you know, let's say six feet deep or so and forward, forward across a river, which we did when we, and we practiced that. A number of times um if you stayed on the roads and you tried to cross bridges oftentimes there were bridges that were not rated uh to the weight of the tank and so um you you incurred the danger of, of collapsing a bridge if you tried to go over it and so you would always have to bypass the bridges um so even if you even if you were staying on the road when you encountered a bridge you had to drop down into the riverbed cross the river and then get back up on the road um on the other side all across the peninsula, there were obstacles and roadblocks. There were um, defiles where the, uh, you know, it was a narrow channel between two hills or mountains and the rocks had, uh, had in place um, what we call rock drops. They were everything from large cribs full of concrete telephone pole like structures. And, you know, in the case of a North Korean invasion, they would just blow those up an obstacle the road because they knew that that mobility was restricted to the road at that point. And so there were all manner of tank ditches and, and obstacles in place across the peninsula uh, to prevent mobility in the case of a North Korean invasion. And so we were very aware of those as well. Always worried that those would be behind us and somebody would blow <laughs> before we could withdraw. How, how close were you up against the DMZ? in in terms of exercises or or deployments you know camp casey was um was south of the dmz north of seoul so it was sort of in between seoul and dmz and i forget what the distance was but it wasn't very far um we we had a general defense perimeter um position that was west of us in the western corridor um and that's where we would go prior to deploying north, um, if, if we had to go up and defend uh, at the DMZ. And then my platoon had a position 
um, on the Imjin River just south of the DMZ. And these were revetted positions uh, that we would go to. We'd stake in the tanks. We'd create our range cards. And, and um, we had, you know, really two missions. One was um, to cover the withdrawal of uh, the DMZ battalion. So there was a, there was a infantry battalion north of the DMZ. And then there was a rotational battalion that went up and augmented that. And then there was the joint security force at Panmunjom. And so our, our primary role on the south bank of the DMZ was to uh, cover the withdrawal of those units if the North Grands attacked. And then our secondary mission was to destroy Freedom Bridge by direct fire. We thought that was sort of an absurd, um, absurd task. Um, it was about a uh, maybe 1,500 or 2,000 meter shot from an M48A5 using service HEP round. And there was this huge, um, looked like a 55 gallon drum strapped under the bridge. And, um, you know, presumably, presumably the engineers would blow up the bridge, but if that didn't work, then we had to hit this thing with a service HEP round, <laughs> which was notoriously inaccurate. Um, but we sat, uh, I remember one night we sat in that position um, and all night long, there was a, a rock army unit across uh, on the other side of the river up in the DMZ. And uh, there, there was uh, automatic fire, tracers, uh, parachute flares. And this firefight went on all night long. And we got to watch it. It was like, it was like watching the fireworks on the 4th of July. Uh, but you never read about it in the papers. You know, it, it, it went on all night. And the next day, you know, you check the news and no mention of it. So this stuff was going on all the time. And, and I think this is one of the, the things that I found incredible when I was doing the, the research for this call with you was that there was something going on in terms of cross-border fire or incursions or something almost every, well, at least every couple of months. But it sounds like there were even smaller cross-border incidents going on that probably aren't on the on the list that, that I looked at. And you compare that to the East German border, where obviously you were deployed later, and it was like, well, nothing was going on there, really, but not the level of belligerent activity that you were seeing in Korea. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and you know, going to the uh, going to the East German border, the Czech border, when I was in the cavalry unit in Germany, um, comparing to that to the DMZ, there was no comparison. I mean, the DMZ in Korea was, um, you know, why they call it a DMZ. They, it's the most militarized strip of ground on the planet. And there was constant friction there. Um, and, and not only there, but, you know, along the coasts, uh, the east and west coasts of, of Korea, there were infiltrators who would try to come in by sea. Um, there were infiltrators, of course, across the Imjin River. But, you know, really everywhere there was, um, there was constant probing and constant infiltrations going on. And, um, you know, and I, I suspect the Rock Army was doing the same thing, um, infiltrating up north. I was surprised to see that you were using the M48 tank, which was not the most up-to-date tank in the uh, U.S. Army's inventory. Why, why was that? You know, I can only speculate. Uh, before before I went to Korea, the tank in Korea was the M60A1. And what the Army did was at a certain point um, – Prior to 1983, they uh, they essentially renovated a bunch of M48s and they upgraded them to M48 A5. And one of the reasons we were told was uh, the suspension was better on the 48 A5 for that type of terrain. Um, I don't know if that's true. As far as I could tell, the only difference was five support rollers versus three. Um, you know, same suspension other than that as far as i could tell it did have uh, a loader's machine gun so it had an m60 delta as the loader's machine gun and of course when when the threat is heavily light infantry 
a loader's machine gun is a very uh, valuable thing to have. And so it had an upgraded, it had, it had a, uh, you know, the same main gun as an M60. It had the um, 105 millimeter uh, main gun. It had an M240 7.62 millimeter coax machine gun. It had an M60 Delta 7.62 loader's machine gun. And then the tank commander's position was an Israeli cupola um, with a M2 HB 50 caliber machine gun for the tank commander position. And so you were, if you were a tank commander, you were firing that exposed. You weren't firing that from inside a cupola. Um, you were firing it, you know, essentially waist up exposed with, you know, the butterfly trigger on the back of the 50 cal. Um, it was a very capable tank. It had a coincident range finder. So um, very, very mechanical tank. Everything about it was mechanical. It wasn't uh, full of electronics. It wasn't, you know, whiz bang thermals or anything like that. It was a very functional, very basic mechanical tank that was easily fixed by at the crew level, at the crew level, and even at, at you know at the battalion level, organizational maintenance. Um, it was much easier to fix than some of the newer tanks are. I guess that that sort of comes to your earlier remark about you know you weren't going to get reinforcements anytime soon so you need to make do with what you've got and be able to repair and refurb as quickly as you can yeah absolutely maintenance uh, maintenance done at the lowest level is is a is a force multiplier um, you didn't have to wait you know a month or two for a repair part to come in because it was generally you know hit it with a ball peen hammer and you can fix it <laughs> It's almost like a Sherman or something like that. <laughs> exactly. I think it, was, it pretty much was. <laughs> and what what were you up against? I mean, we we spoke about the the enemy, the the North Koreans, but what sort of armored threat did the North Koreans have? The North Koreans had pretty rudimentary tanks. Um, you know, we expected uh, that they had. T-54, 55s, um, our basic load, uh, again, was probably configured toward, um, toward an infantry threat. So we had, our basic load was 20, 20 rounds of um, Sabo ammunition, uh, armor piercing, you know, anti-tank kind of uh, round, uh, 20 rounds um, of high explosive anti-tank, which was good against the tank or a personnel carrier or a truck. And then we had, uh, let's see, uh, nine rounds of beehive ammunition, um, anti-personnel flechette rounds. And I think that goes to the light infantry threat. Um, you know, you use those and, and really the, the ones that we have are really old. They were brass case, um, beehive rounds. And then we fired those in a gunnery and replaced them with, um, newly produced apers rounds and quite frankly the brass cased ones the older ones weren't weren't very reliable they would blow out at muzzle you know you'd set the fuse on them to uh let's say uh blow the fl flechettes at about 800 meters or so and invariably you're firing a shotgun they would blow out right at the muzzle so the fuses weren't very good uh and then we had uh five rounds of white phosphorus uh, and that Again, you know, when you think about the North Korean threat, you use those as marking rounds uh, for artillery fire forward observers. Um, generally, that's what you would use those for. So um, 20, 25, and 9 was the basic load for the main gun. Uh, and the flechette, is, are you, is that like a shrapnel round that you're firing? No, it's a little dark. It's a, it, you know, picture... Um, about half of your pinky finger, it's a it's a metal dart with fins on it, and and so uh, the flechettes would go out and take out any light infantry threat that uh, that was there. Right, and how many flechettes would be in a round? Oh, I have no idea. Hundreds, tens. Yeah, probably hundreds. Wow, not something you'd want to be on the end of. No, no. And, and, you know, in Vietnam, they also had a canister round, which was, you know, little ball bearings, but we didn't have those in Korea. Yeah, I've heard of those with the uh, with the British Army, the, the canister round, but mm -hmm. I've not heard of the flechettes before. And 
you, you know, you, you talked about light infantry. What are the sort of numbers that you were facing? Uh, we estimated, um, you know, they had these, North Korea had these planes called the AN-2 Colt, which was a um, very rudimentary, I think, top wing um, transport aircraft. And the, the idea was they had over 100,000 special forces and they would um, deploy those in AN-2 Colts all over the peninsula. Uh, I suspect there were other means of, of, of getting a man, you know, parachute or other other means. But, um, you know, we expected 100,000 special forces all over the peninsula. Um, and then the North Korean People's Army was very heavily light infantry. Um, you know, so when you read about the Korean War and the, you know, the hordes of um, North Korean and Chinese troops, that's, you know, that's generally what our expectation was, um, backed up by massive, massive amounts of artillery fire. So very much uh, the expectation was a rerun of the Korean War of the 1950s, albeit with more special forces infiltration than, than there was then. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Absolutely. Okay, and presumably they would have had everything targeted and ranged with their artillery. So was your base within their artillery range from behind the DMZ? Definitely. I mean, the city of Seoul is in artillery range of, of North Korea from the DMZ. So um, certainly Camp Casey was, and certainly every square inch of it was targeted. And, um, you know, our, our, our tank battalion was tucked into this um, – draw on the south side of a mountain uh we called it dragon valley because our insignia had a dragon on it um but dragon valley w we thought would probably be protected from some of the artillery just because um of the the mountain on the other side of it um but we thought that every aspect of the base was probably targeted and we we suspected that um north korea probably had detailed intelligence about it um, you know, it was a fairly open camp um, with lots and lots of Korean employees. Um, and we used to find North Korean propaganda. I mean, I'd, I would wake up in the morning in my room and there would be a North Korean propaganda leaflet that had been slipped under my door during the night. We even had soldiers who discovered North Korean uh, propaganda leaflets in the maintenance manual inside their tank. Wow. And the tanks were locked up at night, locked up and tarped over. <laughs> so you can imagine that, you know, we, our, our suspicion was, yeah, every square inch was probably targeted. Wow. Wow. What's becoming apparent the more I talk to you is that the, the threat was much more within where you were, more so than there would have been in West Germany. Okay, West Germany, you would have had, you know, perhaps Stasi agents and stuff like that around but you know i've never heard of somebody in west germany waking up with a leaflet in their tank or 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 something like that being thrust under their door maybe i've not been asking the right people that's always the uh, possibility there i'm going to add that to my list of questions actually for anybody who's lived in west germany yeah my my experience in germany was just you know you had the soviet military liaison mission and those, those kind of things and so you knew they were there and they were they were watching you, but you didn't expect that um, that people on your base were, you know, subversive in any way. Um, you know, maybe they were. I mean, yeah. who knows? But I never saw any evidence of it. Um, I suspect there were. I suspect there were maybe some employees who worked somewhere, you know, on an American concern in Germany who were, you know, pacing, <laughs> pacing off the motor pool or whatever they do um, and providing that intel. Um, to East Germans or the Russians, but um, but in Korea, it, it, I mean, we didn't even we didn't even question it. We knew it was happening. So, were you carrying sidearms on a regular basis? I always carried a loaded weapon um, when I was in the field. Um, I carried a loaded M nineteen eleven forty five. I don't think we were supposed to, but we all did. We all carried, you know, we we all carried loaded weapons, um, and in my in my rucksack, I had, I think I had four uh, full magazines for for the grease guns. We had M3 um, submachine guns on each tank, 
and for my tank, I had four full magazines in my rucksack in case something happened. Because, you know, when you're out in the field, um, you know, you, you're generally not going to get small arms ammunition. You're going to you're going to have, you know, what's on your tank, your basic load. So if you're out on a field exercise, you you have those, um, you know, main gun ammunition is on the tank 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even in the motor pool. Um, but when you go out to the field, you don't have your, your 762, you don't have your coax uh, or your M60 Delta or your 50 cal with you because you're on a field exercise. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if something happened when you were in the field and you had some of those North Korean special forces running around or something, you wanted to have something um, with you. And so generally speaking, we all carried loaded weapons when we were out on training exercises. And the, I, I think the leadership probably knew we were doing that and just didn't, didn't object to it. So, but we weren't supposed to be, we weren't supposed to be. <laughs> I'm always amazed that you guys were still carrying the M3 grease gun around, even in the 1980s. I mean, that's like a, a British tank crew using the Sten. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We still, we still had, um, grease guns, um, uh, when I was a troop commander of M1A ones, uh, we still had grease grease guns um, because the, you know the tank crews never really got um, a personal weapon. I mean, you got your you got your um, your M nineteen eleven or your M nine in later years, uh, but the tank crew didn't didn't really have anything um, like a submachine gun or a carbine uh, to do local security with. Um, again, in Korea, you know, we had the M sixty Delta, which is essentially a, a a helicopter version of the M60 machine gun. So it had a bipod uh, on the front of it and you could dismount that. And we would do that all the time. When we were in, um, in position, we would put out local security and we would dismount the M60 Deltas um, to provide local security against an infantry threat. And the only other weapon you had was the M3 Breeze gun. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos, and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters, and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening, and see you next week.